Werner von Braun was known throughout the world as the father of the manned space race. Our Germans are better than their Germans. But who were the first to most of the things I have covered so far throughout this series? The Soviets. And who was behind all of that? Sergei Korolev. But it was not until after his death on January 5th, 1966, that he was known as more than just chief designer to the world, or even within the USSR. He was born in the Ukraine on January 12th, 1907, and was interested in aeronautical engineering while still very young. After studying engineering in school, he began work on rockets as a means to accelerate planes. He helped found GERD in 1931 and soon became its director. In 1938, he was arrested during the Great Purge based on the misleading testimony of three fellow engineers, one of whom was Glushko, a rival. He was sent to Lubyanka prison and spent a year there in terrible conditions until being moved to a prison near Moscow, where he was put to work helping engineer rockets under Glushko, the guy who originally put him away. His success there brought favors, and he was released in 1944. In 1945, he went to the newly conquered Germany to inspect their rocketry program. And when he returned home, he was assigned as the chief designer of a new ballistic missile design bureau. It was there that he developed the R series leading up to the R7 Semyorka. Being capable of delivering intercontinental warheads, the R7 was perfect for delivering a tiny payload to orbit. So in 1957, he engineered the launch of Sputnik. The next years were very successful for him, leading up to Gagarin's flight in 1961. But by 1964, his rivalry with Glushko resumed and they parted ways. Korolev spent the next two years playing politics and dealing with a new president who was less interested in space exploration. And today in history, while undergoing surgery, Korolev suffered complications and died on the operating table at the age of 59. Whatever chance the Soviet moon program had at the time died with him. But that doesn't mean they're done with spaceflight firsts. Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 13 of Project Alexandria, the history of spaceflight for 1966. And today we are setting our sights on the moon. In fact, this entire episode ought to be subtitled Missions to the Moon. Because that's where the United States and the Soviet Union had set their sights throughout the year of 66. Right now, it's January 31st, 1966, and the Soviet Union is launching Luna 9, the first spacecraft to do a semi-soft landing on the moon and the first to return surface images. You are watching the uncut launch footage of my Molnia 8K78M carrying Luna E-6 inside its nice little retextured red fairing, heading into a somewhat polar orbit. The plan is to swing over the top, come back around the bottom of the planet, and after passing the South Pole, zoom out toward the moon. See, the problem is the moon's inclination doesn't pass over the launch site in Baikonur. So instead of being able to go into a low Earth orbit that matches the inclination of our target, we are essentially going to do the equivalent of throwing a baseball at an oncoming target, trying to lead it, and then strike it as it's passing by. The plan is to lift off on this Molnia M, which has slightly improved engines from our previous launches because they keep improving engine efficiency from year to year. Then, as the boosters run out of fuel, we'll drop them and create what is known as Korolev's Cross. We'll continue on using the middle sustainer engine, then the Block L upper stage, and then finally release the payload to do a 48 second mid-course correction to set its final trajectory. Nitrogen RCS jets will orient the vehicle and then we'll coast for three days. Once we reach the moon, we'll discard two compartments that we're carrying on our sides. One compartment contains the radar guidance system and the other contains nitrogen, RCS jets, and batteries. 
We won't need any of that stuff once we get to the moon, so by dropping the mass we can make sure we have enough thrust to slow our descent. We'll also extend out some ground probes that will allow us to detect in the last milliseconds before impact that we've reached the ground. The main engine will shut down early, allowing the outrigger vernier engines to maintain a proper descent speed in the last seconds. We'll only be going about 6 meters per second by the time we reach the surface. The ground probe will sense the moon's surface and trigger the release of the landing capsule. The capsule will be protected by an inflatable airbag. We'll settle in and start taking some pictures. After decoupling, the KTDU main engine on the payload can be used to make a slight mid-course correction to make sure we're coming down on the surface. As I zoom in here, you're going to see that I have temporarily overlaid a special map on the moon after my issue with the American launch, trying to bring down the Ranger where the Apollo 11 is supposed to land and having it be slightly off, I didn't want to miss this time. This map lets me make sure that my maneuver node is striking exactly where Luna 9 is supposed to come down. Then I can alter the texture back to normal, so that for the rest of the flight it'll look like the actual moon rather than a map of the moon overlaid. I'll fast forward now to get us ahead to February 3rd, right before the impact. There won't be a VAB look at this craft since you've seen the launcher before and the payload is right in front of you. In fact, we're dropping the attached compartments now. You can see the payload on top with a protective cover still attached. As we approach the surface, we're going at over 2,000 meters per second, something like 2,400, 2,600 meters per second. Starting off at over 1,500 kilograms and 3 meters tall, we're going to start shedding some of that mass now. And there go the compartments, as well as extending the two probes down at the bottom, and then we'll turn on the engines and watch as the compartments go zipping by. There goes about 300 kilograms. They'll smash into the surface and be destroyed. We're also burning through over 800 kilograms of propellant to slow our descent. You're about to see some of my human errors that didn't happen in the real landing. For one, the airbag should already be deployed for the capsule. For another, I didn't put the engines on an action group to make them shut down as the capsule decouples so they keep burning even after decoupling. The airbag looks a little weird once it's out, which is just a collision glitch with the game or something because sometimes it looked okay in my tests and some sometimes not. But despite all that, we make it to the surface with our almost 100 kilogram payload, open the four protective cover pedals and get ready to take pictures. A special camera with a spinning mirror allows for panoramic images to be taken. The first was taken on the 4th and showed the probe had landed near a crater. Before the second image, the probe slipped down the side of a slight hill it was on. It was okay though and took another panorama. Another aspect of its mission was to measure surface radiation, which it detected as 30 millirads per day. That's enough to show up in tests of exposed humans, but anything under 100 per day can be tolerated for a while, which paves the way for future manned moon missions. Back in the United States, the Saturn program is coming along nicely. There is one launch in February, one in July, and one in August. These are essays 201, then 203, then 202, the numbering out of order once again. All of these were unmanned test flights, checking out different things about the Saturn, the new Saturn 1B launcher. This is actually the first time this has gone up, but despite that, I won't be showing it because it's almost the same as the Saturn 1. Instead, we'll just mention what the three different flights were trying to test. The SA-201 that flew first was an unmanned test flight for the Apollo Command and Service Module. It was a suborbital flight that tested out the reaction control system and other modules on the craft. They boosted it up and then let it come back down again, testing out its heat shield. Then, on AS-203, the flight that came second, they tested the Apollo second stage to make sure that it could restart in space. You can see here in this vintage footage of the liftoff that the second flight did not have that command module. It just has that small little nose cone up on the top there. One cool thing you can see as it's going along here is just as it's breaking the sound barrier, you see that little shock wave as it goes by on the sides there, right around that second stage. And as it gets higher and higher, you can see the plumes as they expand in the lower pressure. 
Once they had carried out all of the tests that they really wanted to do on that second stage, they then experimented with some things that they thought might destroy it, such as depressurizing one tank while letting the other pressurize more. Sure enough, it did destroy it. Finally, in AS-202, the third flight, another suborbital test of the Apollo Command and Service Module went up. This was the first time that they were using a special guidance and navigation control system, as well as the first test of the Apollo fuel cells in space. These successful tests together showed that NASA was probably ready to move on to manned test flights. In March of 1966, around the same time that the Soviet Venera 3 from last episode should be impacting Venus, even though we can't confirm that since we've lost all telemetry, the United States is about to complete one of the most significant space flight firsts in all of history. If you've ever tried docking in stock KSP, then you know how hard docking can be. And in RSS, it's even harder. And in real life, well, who knows? I can tell you who knows. Neil Armstrong and David Scott. Because in a moment, we'll be launching Gemini 8. In fact, 1966 might be known as the Year of the Moon missions, but it could also just as easily be known as the Year of the Gemini. Because the United States will be launching five Gemini missions. This first one is a docking test. So for that, we need a docking target. They took a docking node and attached it to the top of an Agena upper stage, and so that is what I am sending up first. In the background, you may see that the visuals have continued to undergo various changes. I have restored the city texture, although I've erased a lot of the city that's around the space center because it was overlapping the water and making it look like we had Atlantis submerged cities or something. I've also messed around with the scatterer values through the help of fans who have made comments about how I can change different values to improve that look. Our Atlas Agena has dropped two of the engines so far and we're about to drop the whole lower stage, leaving us with our Agena that has our docking target on it. And after dumping the fairing, we'll place ourselves into a roughly 265 kilometer orbit. The real launch was a little higher, but in real life, there's drag, and the Agena, by the time Gemini 8 was able to get to it, was in a lower orbit than that. So I'm just going straight to where the lower orbit was to simulate the fact that there should have been drag in my world. After that, we'll open up the antenna that's on the top side of the Agena. That way we can communicate with it from our Gemini 8 capsule as well as the ground. And then we'll head back to the Space Center. We'll go to Launch Complex 19, where it will be time to launch Gemini 8 with Neil Armstrong and David Scott on board. This mission is scheduled to run for three days, with rendezvous and docking being the first and most important test. Technically, they were going to dock four times, not one. They were going to get close to it, fly around it a little bit, then finally dock. Separate, fly around some more, dock again, and so on, four times. Meanwhile, during the first docking, David Scott was going to do an EVA for over two hours, including the first night side EVA. He was going to do some experiments around Gemini, then EVA over to the Agena for some more science. We've made it to orbit, so our Titan second stage is doing an avoidance maneuver to make sure we don't impact the capsule. Now I'll do some maneuvers and set up a maneuver node in order to get myself intercepting with the Agena target vehicle. The real Gemini 8 did slightly different maneuvers from what I need to do. After the EVA, there would have been more science. Scott was going to extend his EVA tether from 25 feet to 100 feet and use a new EVA support pack with more propellant for EVA maneuvers. 
None of this ever happened due to what happened next on Gemini 8. Okay, we've got a visual on the Agena at 76 miles. Roger, understand. Visual, Agena, 76 miles. Oh, Houston, this is the 8th uh, Air Station keeping on the Agena at about 150 feet. There you go, partner. You done it, boy. You done it. Good job. Do the thing. Boy, look at that. That's beautiful. Need the dipole? Do I ever? I see everything on that fella. Man, that's great. Man, that is really slick. It's a bit of all right. Okay, the first thing we really have to do, platform parallel is from 650 to 710. And they're giving us the SPC loaded yaw maneuver. Okay, Jimmy 8, uh, we have TM solid. You're looking good on the ground. Go ahead and dock. And there they go, Neil Armstrong and David Scott, the first to dock another craft in space. However, all that stuff I said they were going to do next, it's all cancelled when a stuck thruster on the Gemini service module causes them to start spinning out of control. At first, they have no idea what's going on, so they figure it might be a problem with the Agena, and they enter Command 400 into the computer to shut the Agena down. But that does nothing to stop their spin, and in fact, it's getting worse. They decide to undock from the Agena to see if that helps. But while they were docked, the craft was longer and harder to spin, so undocking actually makes things worse. Like an ice skater pulling in their arms to spin faster. The Gemini thruster is still stuck and the spin is getting so bad that their vision is beginning to blur. Toppling end over end, they decide to activate their re-entry RCS to use that to slow and stop the spinning. That works, but also means that they must now abort the mission because protocol dictates that using the re-entry RCS requires subsequently re-entering. That makes this the very first in-space abort of a mission. There won't be another in-space mission abort until Apollo 13. We shall now decouple the service module that had that stuck thruster on it, let that thing float away, and activate our retro engines that will bring us down, but not where we had originally expected we were going to be coming down. We're going to be coming down in the Pacific, so we'll be getting picked up by a backup ship instead. Over the next several days, the ground control was sending the Agena that's still up there through different tests, trying to see if it had been something wrong with that, but there was nothing wrong with it. They ran it through its maneuvers until all of the propellant and electrical power had been completely exhausted. Since no EVA was done, there's still an experiment on there, but we will still be able to get that in the future. So, I warned you, this is the year of the moon. The Soviets have already landed on the surface and taken pictures up close. Now they want to be the first to orbit and map the whole surface from higher up. This is Luna 10 on its way up via another Molnia M 8K78M rocket. It's March 31st, 1966. Korolev's Cross is forming behind us now as the boosters drop away in my stylistic, cartoony look at a launch. Don't worry if this style is not to your liking, I was just messing around with it for fun. The rest of the launch isn't going to look like that. I was just curious if it might look cool at all. But we return now to the normal look of KSP as the payload heads higher and sees space for the first time now that the fairing has dropped away. We'll go into a parking orbit and then warp speed to the trans-lunar burn point. We'll fire up the stage for a second time and start making our way over to the moon. Getting to the moon in RSS is getting pretty easy now, despite the inclination changes from launch site to moon orbit. If you are down too low with old tech instruments, then you can pass over the surface too quickly to get good data about the surface before the whole scene has moved on. And in that case, you can never really catch up, so they're attempting to insert into a lunar orbit of about 350 kilometers to 1,000 kilometers. Since the moon radius is about 1,700 kilometers, that means we need a parasoline of about 2,000 kilometers to an apocelene of about 2,700 kilometers. For now, we've decoupled the payload and we're orienting for our next burn. 
The real Luna 10 entered in orbit with a period of about 178 minutes, and at that rate, they were able to take pictures for 460 lunar orbits before the batteries died out. Lots of scientific instruments sent back all kinds of science. With tests including, but not limited to, magnetics, gravitation, radiation, and surface composition, a major scientific discovery was of what's called mass cons. These are mass concentrations that can affect crafts in orbit, and especially craft trying to land. Mass cons throw off the celestial body's center of mass relative to its geometric center. That's partially why the moon is tidally locked. Remember, the moon revolves once per orbit around Earth, so once a month, which means the exact same side of the moon is always facing Earth, and the other side always faces away. This is because the Earth's gravity is holding the more massive side closer to the Earth while the less massive side is away. So the song that's been playing in the background right now was programmed to be broadcast by the Soviets from the moon. But a funny thing is though, it was supposed to be live, but a missing note in the music caused them to play a recording the next day instead while claiming it was live. We're launching from Cape Kennedy again next, and we're waiting for the Red Arrow Launch Center to come under the blue line showing the target dummy orbit that we're going after. The second red arrow indicates the target dummy itself. I use that in order to align myself on the right inclination for the takeoff. It's May 30th, 1966, and we are launching an Atlas LV-3C Centaur-D from Launch Complex 36A. On board, the payload is Surveyor-1. It's a soft lander that is on its way to the moon here in this Year of the Moon episode. It's the first of seven Surveyor landers that will be going to the moon over the next two years. Surveyor 2 would be later this year, but I won't be showing it. The U.S. lost contact with Surveyor 2 around the time of its mid-course correction and was never heard from again, so it no doubt impacted the surface and was destroyed. Surveyor 3 will be next year and will successfully land at the future landing site of Apollo 12. In fact, the Apollo 12 astronauts visited its landing site and took pictures with the craft. Surveyor 4 crashes like number 2 did, but number 5 landed at the future landing site of Apollo 11. It was the pictures and data taken by these Surveyor landers that paved the way for the Apollo program by letting them know what the terrain was like and where it would be safe to land. Surveyor 6 will land at the end of next year. I won't be showing it in the next episode, but Surveyor 6 was the first craft to lift off again after landing. It was a test. They lifted off about 4 meters, it drifted to the side a bit, and then it soft landed once again. Surveyor 7 was at the start of 1968 and landed in a totally different type of terrain as a way to diversify their scientific discoveries about the moon's surface. It would have been an Apollo landing site, except the Apollo program was cut short at Apollo 17 in favor of spending NASA money on things like Skylab. And there we go, the bottom stage is gone and the Centaur has started up. We'll decouple that fairing to drop some mass and then continue on like this for several minutes. So this is not the first Centaur launch, as you might be able to guess from the dash D on its name, the Centaur D, but this is the first Centaur of my history series. The first Centaur was back in 1962, although it was a failed launch. A Centaur was successfully launched in 1963. Each flight so far was on top of an atlas, just like this flight you're watching now. I'm using liquid hydrogen for the first time, since that's what the Centaur uses for fuel. The oxidizer is still liquid with oxygen just like the atlas below it. The high specific impulse of hydrolox in a vacuum makes it perfect for an upper stage like this. The tanks need to be larger since the density of liquid hydrogen is so low, but it still provides more than enough delta V to get a decently large payload to the moon. In fact, the Centaur was deemed critical to the success of the Surveyor program. Another drawback of the Centaur is the boil off of the liquid hydrogen, which has an even lower boiling point than the liquid oxygen it carries. Early Centaurs could only remain in a parking orbit for about 30 minutes before they'd lose too much fuel from boil off. Over time, they worked on improving the insulation to let the Centaur remain in a parking orbit for five hours. Now the way Surveyor works is the Atlas Centaur puts it on a direct intercept straight from liftoff. There's no parking orbit. We just launch straight at the moon. The payload decouples and coasts until within a few kilometers of the surface. 
At that point, the solid rocket motor is turned on and burns itself out, slowing our craft from over 2 kilometers per second down to a few hundred meters per second. From there, three hypergolic retro motors continue to slow the descent until going almost zero at about 3 to 4 meters from the surface. The retro engines are shut off and surveyor drops the rest of the way, impacting at about 1 to 2 meters per second which is actually soft for Surveyor. For example, Surveyor 5 had a slight problem with its retros and they were turned off even higher, so the craft impacted at 3 meters per second, but was still fine. As you can see, I have temporarily switched over the texture to the landing map to know where Surveyor 1 is supposed to come down. I'll swap back to the normal moon texture once I have my trajectory going there. We set up the maneuver node and now we're doing the burn that puts it to the right spot. Now the real one wouldn't have needed to do this I don't think because the centaur would have had it going in the right place at the right time already. However, in my case, I want to come down exactly where Surveyor 1 was supposed to come down, so I'm doing an off-script mid-course correction to get it at exactly that right same location. There's one other problem I'm having. I think the moon is once again in the wrong location. For some reason, RSS just doesn't like to keep the moon in the right spot. It must be the lack of n-body physics. I'm not entirely sure, but if you look at this right here, you can see that the moon is supposed to have been going into a full moon phase right after the launch, but in my case, it looks like we're going to be landing in the dark, and in fact, we're going to stay in the dark for a while. Now, I suppose what I could have done is the same thing I did last time, where a little hackery shenanigans put the moon in the right place, but then I was going to have to change my trajectory again and do another mid-course correction, and I decided that I could probably just land by instruments and then look at Surveyor once it got around into the sun again. So that's what we're going to do. After landing, Surveyor starts taking pictures and does soil analysis and sends back the data to whatever ground station has line of sight with the vehicle. Eventually, the craft goes into a two-week night cycle and gets no solar power, so it hibernates until the sun rises again, and then spends two weeks straight collecting more data and sending it all back. Ultimately, over 11,000 photos were taken and sent back by Surveyor 1. It managed to survive until 1967 before finally breaking down and giving out. I'll have to come back and revisit this once the sun is up, but for now, we're moving on to the next mission. It should be Gemini 9 because that came next in June. However, there were no real super significant firsts for that flight, so I'll just comment on it. Actually, I'm going to comment on all remaining Gemini flights. Remember, this was the year of the Gemini, and there were five Gemini in 1966. And I can't launch them all and still fit everything in a reasonable amount of time. So, in June, Gemini 9 carried astronauts Tom Stafford and Eugene Cernan. They were the backup crew because the prime crew, Elliot C. and Charles Bassett, were killed in a plane crash in February while on the way to inspect their spacecraft. Stafford and Cernan would have docked to an Agena target, but when they got to it, the fairing had not separated. Cernan did an EVA, but found everything to be excruciating and didn't get much done. Fear spread throughout NASA because this was the second excruciating EVA, and they wondered if effective EVA was even possible. Gemini 10 launched in July, carrying John Young and Michael Collins. They docked with an Agena target and used its engine to climb to a higher altitude, high enough to test radiation to see if it would be a concern for humans on the way to the moon. They also rendezvoused a second time by locating the Gemini 8 Agena target. Michael Collins even EVA'd to it and tethered it to his craft, becoming the first person to meet a separate craft. He also retrieved a science experiment in the Agena, which if you remember I mentioned earlier during the Gemini 8 flight, it had been left behind. They were not able to get it during Gemini 8 since they had that spinning problem and decoupled early. Gemini 11 launched in September carrying Pete Conrad and Dick Gordon. They performed the first ever direct ascent to a target, reaching their Agena in 94 minutes. They set a new altitude record of 1,368 kilometers and created the first artificial gravity by spinning around their tethered Agena. Got plenty of time. 
Gemini 12 launched in November and carried James Lovell and Buzz Aldrin and was the last Gemini flight. Up until now, EVAs were still stressful, extremely hot, and very tiring. But Buzz Aldrin was a scuba diver and had a theory that operating weightless in space might be similar to operating weightless underwater. He trained extensively underwater, and when it came time for his mission, he shattered all fears about EVA by performing every required duty and then some. All without stress, overheating, or even really breaking a sweat. Gemini 12, Houston Capcom, one minute to LOS, new EVA record, beautiful job. For the final mission of 1966, guess where we're going? Correct, the moon. We're not co-nicknaming this episode Year of the Moon for nothing. The Soviets have already placed a payload in orbit there. This time it's the United States about to capture a moon orbit and start taking thousands of pictures in preparation for Apollo landings. I just showed you all the Gemini flights consecutively, but that was only because we were just about to discuss Gemini 9 and it made sense to show all the Gemini together. But technically, this flight happens after Gemini 9 and before Gemini 10. By the way, also after 9 and before 10, there will be an Apollo-Saturn test flight that will carry the first command service module, guidance and navigation control system, and Apollo fuel cells. Basically, it's the whole setup needed for Apollo trips to the moon, so things seem very close to ready for manned Apollo tests after this. But the launch we're watching now is Lunar Orbiter 1. We're using our workhorse launcher, another Atlas SLV-3, Agena D, lifting off from Cape Kennedy, Launch Complex 13 on August 10th, 1966. This is the first of five lunar orbiter missions that will ultimately map 99% of the moon's surface by the end of 1967. At one point, there will be three missions, all flying around the moon at the same time. Ultimately, each craft will be ordered to crash before its RCS fuel runs out though. That way, none of these will be hazards to the upcoming Apollo flights. The orbiter had an ingenious Kodak camera that took pictures that were so high res, they needed to be transmitted back in strips that were later composited into their true image. The camera was programmed to move to compensate for the spacecraft velocity, thereby keeping the exposures from getting fuzzy. I guess all that Cold War spy camera tech development is finally paying off for something non-military. Lunar Orbiter 1 took a picture of Earth rising over the moon, and later on Lunar Orbiter 5, the first ever full Earth picture was taken. Lunar Orbiter 2 will be launched in November of this year, and though I won't be showing them, Lunar Orbiters 3, 4, and 5 will all be in 1967. I haven't taken you into the VAB yet in this episode, but I want to just a little bit to show this Lunar Orbiter because I'm pretty proud of it. I had to make a bunch of custom special parts to get that look and feel just right the way I wanted it. So as you can see, there was an Atlas Agena down here underneath. We'll take that away because you've seen that a few times. Up here we have our payload, but rather than pull it apart, I'm going to show you how I put it together. So here are several custom lunar orbiter parts. I made a special camera module, and I made my own frame that I could put around it. it goes on like this. The camera sits in there, and then around the outside here, these are all micrometeor detectors. Up on the top, we have our orbiter fuel tanks, as well as a panel, a heat shield, to protect it from the high temperatures of this Marquard R4D engine that goes right up there on that. Then I can click on here to fill it with my MMH and NTO just by hitting that. It already had in there some nitrogen to power the Lunar Orbiter RCS, and the way I got those on is first I selected one and I put it on like this. Then I used the rotation tool to give it a little bit of a rotation down like that. Then I grabbed it, did some symmetry to bring it up to four times, and placed it right on the side here. And then switched back to my translation tool and then just shoved it into the spot that I wanted right up there. There is a star tracker, and I put one star tracker down here on the bottom, right in a 
about that location and had to use the translation tool in order to get that shifted into the right spot. I took an antenna that was actually specifically designed to look like it was part of the orbiter, made by a guy, a modder named Blue Dog, and I put one of those on there. At first I thought about using this dish over on this side, but it wasn't pointing in the right direction, so ultimately I went with one of these, I customized a dish just the right size, put it over here on an infernal robotics hinge and a long arm, and then also put four solar panels around the outside right here, just like so, and then just used the translation tool to get those down in closer to the body like that. At one point, I had been experimenting with this for a solar panel instead, but ultimately decided to go with this one that I could get customized with the coloring and the look and feel that I wanted. This is just your standard squad kind. This one here, I was able to retexture to make the back look like it was made out of dark panels. So if we return to the actual launcher for it one more time and we pull away all the stuff, you can see how I had it packed down then there inside that fairing base and of course one thing i didn't just show you but it had on it was more lights oh and i totally forgot of course the most important part is the actual camera from the hull camera mod we're going into a parking orbit for about half an hour before the trans lunar injection burn the flight will be about 92 hours. Along the way, Lunar Orbiter 1 experienced overheating and the Star Tracker failed. They fixed the problem by navigating using the moon itself as a reference and by reorienting the craft 36 degrees off its intended axis, deflecting more of the sun's rays. That's definitely the real problem in space. Everyone always thinks, but isn't it cold in space? However, think about what it's like in the summer, in a car with the windows up with no shade. And that's on Earth, where there's actually some atmosphere in the way to at least deflect a little of the heat and convection cooling. In space, on the way to the moon, there's no shade and heat can only radiate for cooling. It's just constant beating sun 24-7 until the inside of the spacecraft is like an oven or a car in the summer sun. So the real problem in space isn't that it's cold, it's how to prevent or at least remove the heat. Once Lunar Orbiter 1 reaches the moon, it'll go into a near equatorial orbit and take pictures of potential Apollo landing sites. Lunar Orbiters 2 and 3 will do the same thing, and by that point, all the pictures we need will have been taken. So Lunar Orbiter 4 will go into a polar orbit and take pictures out of pure scientific curiosity. Lunar Orbiter 5 went back for some follow-up images of selected Apollo landing sites, so it was once again in equatorial orbit, though it also took some images of the far side of the moon after its primary objective was accomplished. Lunar Orbiter 1 took 229 pictures of the moon covering 5 million square kilometers, and like I said earlier, the entire Lunar Orbiter program took thousands of images. For example, Lunar Orbiter 2 took over 800 pictures all by itself, and number 2 took this image of a crater that was dubbed by the media as one of the greatest pictures of the century. Lunar Orbiter 1 flew for two months before the RCS fuel was getting low, so NASA crashed it intentionally into the far side of the moon. In 2007, the Lunar Orbiter Image Recovery Project was started to take the old analog images and convert them to enhanced digital format. Additionally, the images were composited by computers instead of the old way, which was to hand assemble the image strips and then take a second photo of the assembled photos. That's like taking a copy of a copy, so you can imagine how much better the images are now. Well, we've made it to the moon, we're in our orbit, and we're taking our pictures, so that's going to do it for 1966. Until next time, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.